As an historian, I'm often asked if I could stop one event in modern history from happening, what would it be? My answer is World War I. If there had been no World War I, there would have been no Russian Revolution, no World War II, no Holocaust, no Cold War. And that doesn't even consider the millions who died in the war itself. Following the end of the Napoleonic Wars in 1815, Europe experienced an unprecedented period of economic growth. Brought about by the Industrial Revolution, this new prosperity spawned rapid developments in science, medicine, art and political philosophy. The future of civilization never looked brighter. And then suddenly, it all went up in flames. The fuse was lit in June 1914 in a street in Sarajevo, Bosnia. It was there that Archduke Franz Ferdinand, the heir to the Austro-Hungarian Empire, was assassinated by a Serbian nationalist. It should have been no more than a sad footnote in history. Instead, it changed history. Austria-Hungary, seeking to avenge the Archduke's murder, declared war on Serbia. But before taking this drastic step, it asked for, and received, a blessing from its powerful ally, Germany. Serbia, knowing that it had no chance against Austria-Hungary, called on its ally, Russia, to defend it. Russia agreed. To strengthen its hand, Russia solicited French support should war break out. France, ever suspicious of German intentions, assented. Germany then made a preemptive move to take France out of the war. The German command, having long planned this war, invaded France through neutral Belgium. This prompted Britain to join France against Germany. Suddenly, the entire continent was engulfed in war. The key player was Germany. Their strategy was to punch through Belgium and France and capture Paris before the French had time to react. This was the so-called Schlieffen Plan, named after the German general who conceived it. With France conquered, they would turn their attention to Russia. That Germany thought it would actually work comes down to one man, Germany's leader, Kaiser Wilhelm II. The Emperor of Germany from 1888 until his forced abdication in 1918, Wilhelm was a profoundly unpleasant, unstable and vicious personality. By 1914, he believed that Germany should not only dominate Europe, but the entire world. Had the Schlieffen Plan worked, Germany most certainly would have. But it didn't work. The British and the French put up stiff resistance in the West. Russia did the same in the East. The losses incurred by all sides were immediate and appalling. The widespread use, for the first time, of barbed wire, machine guns, tanks, and worst of all, poison gas, turns the fields of France and the steppes of Russia into vast cemeteries. By 1917, the war was at a stalemate. Who knows how long it would have stayed that way if the United States had not been drawn in. Ironically, President Woodrow Wilson had been elected largely because he promised to keep America out of Europe's war. His attitude changed when Germany attacked American merchant ships in the Atlantic. The final straw was the infamous Zimmermann telegram, in which Germany promised to give Mexico, in exchange for its military support, much of the American Southwest, including Texas. The infusion of American manpower and weaponry allowed the Allies to take the initiative. The war finally ended in November of 1918. 16 million people, soldiers and civilians, were dead. 3 million Russians, 2.5 million Germans, 1.7 million French, 1 million British, and 117,000 Americans. Russia was now in the hands of Vladimir Lenin and the Bolsheviks. France and Britain were physically and morally shattered. Germany, forced into a humiliating surrender treaty at Versailles, would soon be further decimated by runaway inflation that destroyed what was left of its economy. Meanwhile, the United States retreated into isolationism. It was a pause, not a peace. The stage was being set for a new and very much worse disaster, 
a second world war, one that would lead to three times the deaths of the first one. It would be instigated by a madman who fought for the Kaiser and shared the same dream of world domination. Had it not been for World War I, we would never have heard of him. I'm Andrew Roberts for Prager University. I'm going to talk to you about the most important thing you will ever have. Now try to guess what that might be. For example, is it money? Well, it's certainly better to have money than not to, but it's definitely not the most important thing you can have. Just ask all the rich people who were very unhappy. Or even better, read about what's happened to most of the people who win tens of millions of dollars in a lottery. Most of these people actually became less happy, not more. So all right then, what about love? Is that the most important thing you can ever have? Well, love sure is important. I can't imagine living without it. I treasure the love of my friends and the love of my family. But if you don't have the thing I'm about to tell you, you won't receive much love at all. So let's try a third answer. Happiness. Well, that too is very, very important. Who wants to be unhappy? But again, without the thing I will tell you about, there would be little happiness in the world. So here goes. The most important thing you will ever have is, drum roll please, good values. Yes, good values. Now I know that may sound boring, and I realize that it's possible that you may have never really thought about values or even know what I'm talking about. So let me explain. A value is something you think is more important than anything else. More important than money, more important even than love, and even more important than happiness. And above all, values are what you consider to be more important than your feelings. This is very hard for a lot of people to believe because we live in a time when people think that how they feel about something is more important than anything else. But that isn't so. Here's a simple example of the conflict between a feeling and a value. Just about everyone feels like eating junk food. Uh, but there's a big problem here. If you eat whatever you feel like eating, you will end up obese and unhealthy. So then, what is it that stops people from eating all the food they feel like eating? The answer is a value. That's right, a value. And what is that value? Not getting obese and staying healthy. There is, in other words, a necessary battle that goes on inside of most people. The battle between what they feel, in this case the desire to eat junk food, and a value that they hold, in this case staying healthy and looking good. Now, as important as a healthy body is, this conflict between what we feel like doing and values is even more important when it comes to how we treat other people, not just ourselves. Here's one that will make you think. Imagine you're walking on a beach with the dog you love, when all of a sudden you look out at the water and you see your dog drowning. And imagine, too, that at the same time, about 100 feet from your dog, a person you don't know, a stranger, is also drowning. Now, which would you try to save first? Uh, just about anyone who loves their pet would feel like saving their pet first. But what if you value human life even more than an animal's life? And you probably do. After all, you probably eat animals, but you wouldn't eat a human being then your value, the unique preciousness of human life, is in conflict with your feelings for your dog. Here's another example. Imagine you are about to take an important test at school. If you cheat on that test, you'll be able to avoid failing and maybe even get into some great school. But what if you have a value, what we call a moral value, that cheating is wrong? You sure feel like cheating, but if you have moral values, you know it's wrong to. Again, that battle between your feelings and a value. Almost everything that is wrong with the world comes from people either not having higher moral values or not living by them because they feel they want to do something else. People who murder feel like murdering and they do what they feel 
rather than live by the value of preserving human life. People who steal feel that they want the thing that they steal, so they take what they feel like having rather than live by the value of not stealing. The list is pretty much endless. And that's why good values are the most important thing any of us can ever have. Without them, the world would be a very terrible place. And finally, know this. The best people you know, meaning the nicest, kindest, and most honest, are people who battle their feelings every day of their lives. So should you. I'm Dennis Prager. In Plymouth, Massachusetts, in the autumn of 1621, 53 men, women, and children celebrated their first harvest in the New World. The great Indian chief, Massasoit, brought 90 of his men to the three-day party. From all reports, a good time was had by all. How did this event, which happened almost 400 years ago, become a part of the American story and our oldest national tradition? Credit goes to many people, but two stand out. One you know and one you should know, Abraham Lincoln and Sarah Josepha Hale. More on both in a moment. As a religious people, Americans have always had a keen sense they have been blessed by providence. The Pilgrims certainly felt this, and so did subsequent generations, including George Washington. Washington was the first president to declare a national day of public thanksgiving and praise. But it wasn't until the Civil War that the idea of a National Day of Thanksgiving fully took hold. In the autumn of 1863, at the height of the Civil War, when Americans were bitterly divided, Abraham Lincoln nevertheless called for a day of national thanksgiving. Lincoln began his proclamation this way. The year that is drawing toward its close has been filled with the blessings of fruitful fields and healthful skies. This was an extraordinary way to characterize 1863, the bloodiest year of the war. But even in the midst of a civil war of unequaled severity and magnitude, Lincoln continued, the nation had much to be thankful for and much to look forward to. The day was coming when America would again be united and experience, as Lincoln put it, a large increase of freedom. It was a profoundly hopeful message reminding Americans of their nation's capacity for renewal. Lincoln's decision to call for a national thanksgiving came at the urging of a far-sighted and persistent magazine editor who believed such a celebration would have a deep moral influence on the American character. Her name was Sarah Josepha Hale. More than any single person, she is the reason we celebrate Thanksgiving today. By the 1840s, many states had established an annual day of Thanksgiving, but the date varied widely from state to state. Hale saw the value of a day in which the entire nation celebrated as one. For two decades, she conducted a campaign to consolidate public support for her idea. As the influential editor of one of the most popular periodicals of the 19th century, year after year she wrote columns making the case for the holiday. She published fiction and poems with a Thanksgiving Day theme, and she offered her readers recipes for traditional Thanksgiving dishes, such as roast turkey and pumpkin pie. And by the way, she also wrote the nursery rhyme, Mary Had a Little Lamb. Presidents Zachary Taylor, Millard Fillmore, and Franklin Pierce, to whom she had written letters, showed little interest in her cause, but Lincoln saw its potential. His proclamation was the first in what became an unbroken string of annual Thanksgiving proclamations by every subsequent president. Congress finally sealed the deal in 1941, when President Franklin Roosevelt signed legislation making Thanksgiving an official national holiday. Lincoln and Hale believed the act of expressing gratitude had tremendous healing power, In his Thanksgiving proclamation, Lincoln spoke not as commander-in-chief of the Union forces, but as president of the entire nation, North and South. He made no reference to rebels or enemies. Rather, the president spoke of the whole American people. It's a message that resonates today when Americans, even within families, are divided over issues of politics and culture. Thanksgiving, our nation's oldest tradition, 
brings us together, just as it brought the pilgrims and Indians together in 1621. Lincoln said it best when he called on every American to celebrate Thanksgiving with one heart and one voice. Thanksgiving gives us a moment to focus on the blessings of being Americans, on the prosperity, security, and freedom we enjoy. If Lincoln could focus on these blessings in the middle of the Civil War, we should certainly be able to do so today. Here's a suggestion. At this year's Thanksgiving table, ask everyone to spend a minute to say what they are grateful for. I suspect you'll find your guests will have a long and eloquent list. And if they don't, you can help them out. Suggest they start with family, friends, and living in the freest country in the world. After all, if we don't give thanks, what's the point of Thanksgiving? I'm Melanie Kirkpatrick, Senior Fellow at the Hudson Institute and author of Thanksgiving, The Holiday at the Heart of the American Experience for Prager University. I am the proud son of immigrants from Bangladesh. I was raised in New York City, which has benefited enormously from the energy and ambition of the millions of people born abroad who've chosen to make it their home. But I also believe that America's immigration system needs to work for America. And right now, that is simply not the case. We need a new immigration system. So what should it be? We're often presented with two stark choices, severe restrictions or open borders. I think there's a better way. But before I offer a solution, let's look at the usual suspects. The case for open borders is, on the surface, pretty attractive. Tens of millions of people around the world would be grateful to come to America for the chance to live in peace and earn a decent living. The vast majority of them mean us no harm. Why not give them a chance to share in the blessings of liberty? The simple answer is that our country is more than just a marketplace. We're a democracy based on a social contract. Americans pay taxes so that, among other things, the poorest, most unlucky among us can still lead decent and dignified lives. If you can't work, you might be eligible for unemployment benefits or disability. If you do work, but your paycheck doesn't go far enough for you to afford medical care or food for your kids, we have a safety net designed to help you stay afloat. Liberals and conservatives disagree on how extensive this safety net ought to be, but they all agree it needs to be there. The question is, how far are we willing to stretch it? A century ago, immigrants who found they couldn't make it in America had little choice but to go back home. That is no longer the case. These days, immigrants who can't earn enough to support their families have access to many government benefits. That doesn't make them bad people. In an age of offshoring and automation, wages for menial jobs don't go very far. If we only admitted a modest number of low-skill immigrants, say as political refugees, we could easily handle it. But over the past 40 years, we have allowed millions of low-skill immigrants into the country, both legally and illegally. While highly educated immigrants pay far more in taxes than they consume in benefits, the opposite is true of immigrants with less than a high school diploma. Immigrant engineers working for Google, Amazon, and Apple do just fine without government help. The immigrant janitors and busboys who serve them struggle to afford housing and to give their kids a decent start in life. Without government aid, many would go hungry. If we were to open our borders, the number of low-skilled immigrants would skyrocket, and so too would the cost of meeting their needs. Ironically, this would only exacerbate the wealth disparity that so animates the open borders crowd. Maybe the rich could wall themselves off in gated communities. But the growing ranks of the poor and even the middle class would have to deal with ever more strained social services. That could provoke resentment strong enough to set off real class warfare. If open borders are a bad idea, so too is severely restricting immigration. For one, immigration has always been part of the American story, and it continues to be an essential source of talent, from Silicon Valley to medicine to pro sports. Why shut ourselves off from the dynamism and energy that immigrants can bring? Thankfully, there is a way to fix this problem. We can modernize the system to give priority to those who have strong skills and job offers. People, in other words, who will pay more in taxes than they need in benefits. 
Today, we admit about two-thirds of immigrants on the basis of family ties, and only 15 percent on the basis of skills. We need a course correction. We should limit family immigration to immediate family members, such as spouses and minor children, while greatly expanding the number of skills-based visas. A skills-based point system would be a huge boon for people around the world looking to live the American dream. It would give them a predictable, step-by-step -step guide for how to better their chances at a green card. Just as importantly, by prioritizing immigrants with strong skills, we'd make the safety net much easier to sustain for those with low skills whom we'd still admit, albeit at a more modest level. Let's announce to the world that if you're ambitious, if you have skills we prize, the golden door is open. If you can support yourself and your family and add to our economy, we want you. If we aspire to an immigration system that works, this is the most realistic and idealistic choice. I'm Raihan Salam, Executive Editor of National Review for Prager University. When I was the Prime Minister of Canada, I was often asked this question, why do you support Israel? My response, in effect, was always the same. Why wouldn't I support Israel? Why wouldn't I support a fellow democratic nation where open elections, free speech, and religious tolerance are the everyday norm? Why wouldn't I support a country with a vibrant free press and an independent judiciary? Why wouldn't I support a valuable trading partner and a wellspring of amazing technological innovation? Why wouldn't I support our most critical ally in the Middle East and in the international struggle against terrorism? In a rational world, in a world where simple common sense prevailed, the question, why do you support Israel, would be like asking, why do you support Australia or Canada? But we don't live in that rational common sense world. So the case for Israel has to be made over and over. I, for one, am happy to make it. Let me start with this. Every military action Israel has ever taken has been to protect itself. Israel is not an aggressor state. It's a defensive state. This has been true from its founding to this day. As a fledgling nation in 1948, Israel was immediately attacked by its Arab neighbors. Their goal was not to contain the tiny new country. It was to annihilate it. No nation came to Israel's aid. Not the United States, not my country, Canada, not the United Kingdom, no one. They all thought Israel would lose, but it didn't lose, it won. In 1967, Israel's neighbors again sought to utterly destroy the Jewish state, a nation that had then existed for two decades. Again, Israel prevailed, and it survived another all-out attack in 1973. Those are the big wars, but I'm not sure there's been a single day in Israel's entire history when some act of terror has not been waged against it, inside or outside its borders. There have been two bloody waves of terror, so-called intifadas, in the late 1980s and the early 2000s, when Israelis were blown up on buses, at pizza parlors, and celebrating weddings. There have been incursions from terror groups like Hezbollah in Lebanon. There have been thousands of rocket attacks from Hamas in the Gaza Strip, even after Israel completely withdrew from that territory in 2005. In between the wars, in between the terror, Israel has sought peace with its neighbors, and it has achieved peace treaties with Egypt and Jordan. For others, however, every Israeli gesture for peace is met with incitement and violence. I recount this history for one reason. Any nation that has endured what Israel has endured could easily have become a police state. But through it all, Israel has never abandoned its commitment to the rule of law, to democracy, to tolerance. One-fifth of its citizens are Muslim. They enjoy the same rights as Jewish citizens. They occupy key positions in the nation's courts, press, and government. And they have their own parties representing them in the Knesset, Israel's parliament. To say that Muslims in Israel are the freest Muslims in the region is an understatement. How about this as a human rights test? Prisoners in Israel, be they Jewish or Arab, are well-treated, well-fed, and have access to the best possible medical care. Parents and spouses of these prisoners know where they are and that they are safe. Who else in the region but Israel can make that claim? Through all the wars and all the terror, 
Israel has survived, and especially in the last 20 years, it has thrived. It's known as Startup Nation, and with good reason. Key components of your cell phone and your laptop were designed in Israel. A drug or a medical device that has saved your life or the life of a loved one may have been developed in Israel. Yet there are leftist politicians, activists, artists, academics, and college students who devote their lives to denouncing Israel, calling for boycotts, demanding it be cut off from academic and professional societies. Do they denounce the Palestinian leadership that hasn't held an election in well over a decade? Do they denounce the leadership of Hamas, who use women and children as human shields to protect their fighters? No, they denounce free, vibrant, democratic, innovative Israel. With all the brutal and violent regimes, not only in the Middle East, but around the world, how is one to explain singling out Israel for condemnation? Sadly, only one explanation fits, anti-Semitism. Do these haters of Israel question the legitimacy of any other democratic nation, of any nation for that matter? Of course, the answer is no. Somehow, they only manage to oppose the Jewish one. The state of Israel has now existed for 70 years. It is one of the freest, most prosperous, most successful nations on earth. Why do I support Israel? Why wouldn't I? Why wouldn't anyone? I'm Stephen Harper, 22nd Prime Minister of Canada for Prager University. There were 36,525 days in the 20th century. Of these, none was more consequential than June 6, 1944, D-Day, the Allied invasion of Normandy in Nazi-occupied France. It did not end World War II, but without it, the Nazi war machine would not and could not have been defeated. We, of course, know the good guys. America, England and its allies won. But in 1944, there was no certainty of success. In fact, there was just as much doubt as confidence. Winston Churchill's senior advisor, Field Marshal Brooke, wrote in his diary, I am very uneasy about the whole operation. It may well be the most ghastly disaster of the whole war. Brooke's fears were entirely reasonable. First, there were tens of thousands of men and millions of tons of material and supplies that had to be moved 100 miles across one of the roughest bodies of water in the world, the English Channel, and it had to be kept secret. If the Germans knew where and when the Allies were landing, they could mass forces against them and turn the beaches of northern France into killing fields. To prevent this, the Allies took every possible precaution. Their air forces destroyed bridges, roads and railways that might be used by the Germans to rush troops to the invasion site. Everyone knew the attack was coming. The key was to keep the Germans guessing. Fake radio chatter was broadcast to suggest the beaches near Calais would be the landing point. Double agents leaked fake details of units forming in southeast England, and movie set designers built phony tanks, planes and ships to support the ruse of an army preparing to cross near Dover for the benefit of German reconnaissance pilots and spies. The Germans swallowed it all. But the Nazis were not the only enemy the Allied forces faced. Mother Nature was just as threatening. The 23,000 paratroopers and glider-borne infantry jumping into Normandy needed moderate winds to be effective. The 12,000 Allied aircraft needed clear skies. The invasion fleet of 6,000 vessels needed calm seas, and there had to be a low tide to expose Nazi obstacles and mines. When high winds and rain began pummeling the Channel, Allied Supreme Commander General Dwight Eisenhower postponed the invasion date of June 5th by 24 hours. That might not sound like a significant delay, but it was. All forces were concentrated and ready to go. All the plans, all the deceptions could be exposed at any moment. Then came a new forecast. The weather appeared to be breaking. There might be a 12-hour window of opportunity. Eisenhower gave the order, we go. Immediately, the greatest invasion fleet ever assembled set sail. On board were over 130,000 young soldiers. Consider for a moment who these soldiers were. The average age of the American GIs was 21. Most had never seen combat or even been 50 miles from their hometown. As they sailed to the French shoreline, 
Eisenhower wrote a press release in case of catastrophe. D-Day was an all-or-nothing affair. A new invasion strategy would take months, if not years, to devise. The initial battle reports were seriously troubling. At Omaha Beach, overlooked by cliffs honeycombed with trenches, cannon and machine guns, the Americans took heavy losses. I might have killed hundreds that morning, reflected German soldier Hein Sevelo manning one of the bunkers. The rough surf also took its toll. Dr. Hal Baumgarten, with the US Army's 116th Infantry, remembered, some of the fellows were pulled under by their wet combat jackets and heavy equipment. We couldn't help. They just drowned. Further along, Army Rangers took heavy casualties as they scaled the cliffs under intense gunfire. However, by midday, with US naval support, the Germans, low on supplies and ammunition, began to fold. Nazi reinforcements, including hundreds of tanks, which might have made all the difference, were not ordered to Normandy until the afternoon. Before the Germans could mount an effective counterattack, the Allies had secured all five landing beaches. Churchill had expected 20,000 to be killed on D-Day. Fortunately, heavy though they were, the losses were much lower. Of the 156,000 Allied personnel who hit the beaches that day, 10,000 became casualties. Of these, 5,000 were killed. No one died in vain. Their sacrifice meant an end to Nazi Germany and the Holocaust. Another year of bitter fighting lay ahead, but D-Day, June 6, 1944, was a pivotal step on the road to forever removing the Nazi tyranny from Europe and the world. I'm Peter Caddick Adams, author of Sand and Steel, A New History of D-Day, for Prager University. There's a book you can read to your children that will make your job as a parent a lot easier. This book will teach them lessons in character, how to distinguish right from wrong, about gratitude, respect, and perseverance. And that's in the opening chapters. Parents have been reading this book to their children for a very long time. It's one reason it's a perpetual bestseller. This book, of course, is the Bible. And you don't have to be religious to read it, and your children don't have to be religious to enjoy it and get a whole lot out of it. Decency, kindness, charity, selflessness, and sacrifice, they're all right there. Consider the story of David and Goliath. Nine feet tall, clad in armor, Goliath is the most fearsome warrior of his day. How could he not be? He's nine feet tall, for goodness sake. Who wants to go against a giant like that? No Israelite, that's for sure. Except for one, a skinny shepherd boy named David. This boy has three things going for him. Courage, a slingshot, and faith that God is with him. As he strides out onto the battlefield to face Goliath in single combat, he holds the future of the Israelite nation, not to mention his own life, in his hands. Wrapped up in all of this tension and drama are valuable lessons that any child can profit from. David refuses to be intimidated by a bully. He's willing to act, to show resolve, even in the face of his own self-doubt. His actions paint a portrait of true heroism in the face of true danger. Isn't that the kind of strength we want our children to emulate? To be able to defend themselves and later their families and their country. Or how about the story of the brothers, uh, Cain and Abel? Abel, the shepherd, looks at his lot and he's filled with gratitude for his blessings. He offers as a gift to God the very best of his flock. Cain, the farmer, is selfish, unsatisfied with what he has, and he offers only a paltry gift of grain. When God favors Abel's present, Cain allows jealousy to overwhelm him. God speaks to Cain and tells him, I know you're feeling angry but you can overcome those feelings and master them. Cain doesn't listen, doesn't control his jealousy, and kills Abel. When God asks Cain, where is Abel, your brother? Cain lies and says, I do not know. And then, am I my brother's keeper? Yes, should have been Cain's answer to his own question. We are responsible for ourselves and we have an obligation to others. We all have emotions and passions, but God has given us the tools to master those emotions. And master them we must if we are to live a productive and ethical life. 
Most important of all, life is a gift from God. We have no right to take it away from the innocent. Murder is evil. All these lessons are contained in this one story. The stories of David and Goliath and Cain and Abel are only two examples of the many invaluable lessons the Bible offers to children. Think of a lesson and there's a Bible story to teach it about family dynamics, friendship, forgiveness, leadership, humility, about what is important and what is not. The Bible also teaches children more effectively than any book ever that they are not the center of the universe. They're accountable to their parents and to God. Children who internalize this lesson are much more likely to be kinder and more mindful of how they behave than those who do not. The Bible discourages narcissism. Of course, the Bible is not merely a children's book. It's a library of wisdom for everyone. Here's how Abraham Lincoln, who was not a churchgoer, but who was steeped in the Bible, described it. In regard to this great book, it is the best gift God has given to man. But for it, we could not know right from wrong. And all things most desirable for man's welfare are to be found portrayed in it. As Lincoln suggests, the Bible is the moral foundation on which Western civilization is built and a point of shared reference. Up until the 1960s, you could cite a Bible story and most people knew exactly what you were talking about. Everyone from Shakespeare to Dickens to Franklin Roosevelt made great use of Bible stories to communicate their themes. We're losing that connection. And that is a terrible shame and a profound cultural loss. If you don't have some biblical literacy, You can't fully appreciate the powerful words of Martin Luther King, for example. Only if you know the story of Moses can you fully appreciate King's poetic vision of having seen the promised land. Of the Bible, Yale theologian George Lindbeck famously said, There was a time when every educated person, no matter how professedly unbelieving or secular, knew the actual text from Genesis to Revelation. Our goal should be to get back to that kind of biblical literacy. And it starts with our children, your children. Read them a Bible story tonight. Who knows? You might learn a few things too. I'm Johnny Moore for Prager University. Was Jesus a socialist? Well, if socialism is nothing more than being kind to other people, then you might think the answer is yes. But you could be kind to other people and be a capitalist. John D. Rockefeller probably gave away more money than anyone in human history, and he was certainly a capitalist. Bill Gates and Warren Buffett have given away millions, too. To get an accurate answer to our question, we need to define socialism. Socialism is the concentration of power into the hands of government elites to achieve the following purposes. Central planning of the economy and the radical redistribution of wealth. Jesus never called for any of that. Nowhere in the New Testament does he advocate for the government to punish the rich or even to use tax money to help the poor. Nor does he promote the ideas of state ownership of businesses or central planning of the economy. In Luke 12, Jesus is confronted by a man who wants him to redistribute wealth. Master, the man says to Jesus, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replies, Man, who made me a judge or divider over you? And then he rebukes the man for being envious of his sibling. How about Jesus' parable of the talents? Talents were a form of money in Jesus' day. A man entrusted three of his workers with his wealth. The two who invested the money and made a profit were praised, and the one who buried his share so he wouldn't lose any of it was reprimanded. Sounds a lot more like an endorsement for capitalism than socialism, doesn't it? Yes, Jesus spoke of the difficulty for a rich man to enter heaven, but not because having money is evil. It's not money, rather it is the love of money, the New Testament tells us, that leads to evil. Jesus was warning us not to put acquisition of money and material possessions above our spiritual and moral lives. Was Jesus promoting a socialist model when he kicked the money changers out of the temple in Jerusalem? Again, the answer is no. Note the location where the incident occurred. It was in the holiest of places, God's house. Jesus was not angry at buying and selling in and of themselves. He was angry that these things happened in a house of prayer. 
He never drove a money changer from a marketplace or from a bank. Jesus advises us to be of generous spirit, to show kindness, to assist the widow and the orphan. But he clearly means this to be our responsibility, not the government's. Consider Jesus' Good Samaritan story. A traveler comes upon a man at the side of a road. The man had been beaten and robbed and left half dead. What did the traveler, the Good Samaritan, do? He helps the unfortunate man on the spot with his own resources. Ask yourself, to help the poor, would Jesus prefer that you give your money freely to the Salvation Army, for example, or have it taxed by politicians to fund a welfare bureaucracy? Progressives like to point out that Jesus said, Render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. But that has absolutely nothing to do with high taxes or wealth redistribution. It was the seed for the idea of separating church and state. It certainly wasn't the same as saying that whatever Caesar says is his must then be so, no matter how much he demands or what he intends to use it for. So there is no evidence that Jesus was a socialist, and there's lots of evidence that he supported free markets. In addition to the parable of the talents, Jesus offers his parable of the workers in the vineyard. In it, a landowner hires some laborers to pick grapes. Near the end of the day, he realizes he needs more workers to get the job done. To recruit them, he agrees to pay a full day's wage for just one hour of work. When one of the laborers who had worked an entire day complains, the landowner answers, I'm not being unfair to you, friend. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? That's a testament to the principles of supply and demand, of private property, and of voluntary contracts, not socialism. Jesus never endorsed the forced redistribution of wealth. That idea is rooted in envy, something that he and the Tenth of the Ten Commandments railed against. Most importantly, Jesus cared about helping the less fortunate. He never would have approved anything that undermines wealth creation. And the only thing that has ever created wealth and lifted masses of people out of poverty is free market capitalism. Read the New Testament. The plain meaning of the text is loud and clear. Jesus was not a socialist. He couldn't be. He loved people, not the state. I'm Lawrence Reed, president of the Foundation for Economic Education for Prager University. Napoleon Bonaparte was the most famous man of the 19th century. At the peak of his power, he personally controlled more of the European continent than anyone since the great emperors of Rome. Today, most people see him as an ambitious little man with an outsized ego. Others see him as a forerunner of the great aggressor of the 20th century, Adolf Hitler. This portrait is as flawed as it is unfair. Napoleon Bonaparte was born on the 15th of August 1769 on the Mediterranean island of Corsica. Ironically, the island, long connected to the city-state of Genoa, Italy, only became part of France the year before he was born. But for this twist of fate, Napoleon would never have been a French citizen, let alone its emperor. His parents sent him to the mainland at the age of nine, where he studied to be a soldier. His facility in mathematics, organization, and map reading marked him for future success. The French Revolution, with its overworked guillotine, provided a unique opportunity for advancement, that is, for anyone who could keep his head, literally. Napoleon did. He became a general by the age of 24. At the age of 26, he achieved a series of stunning victories in Italy against an Austrian army that had come to destroy the revolution and return the French royal family, the Bourbons, to the throne. These victories made him a national hero. As shrewd a politician as he was a general, by the first month of the new century, at the tender age of 30, Napoleon was the undisputed leader of France. He crowned himself emperor on December 2nd, 1804, turning the French Republic into the French Empire with a Bonaparte line of succession. Napoleon's establishment of a French Empire only increased the fears of the royal houses of Europe and of France's historical enemy, Britain. As a result, 
in September 1805, Austria invaded Bavaria, a French ally, and Russia joined the attack. Napoleon and his Grande Armée roundly defeated them at the Battle of Austerlitz. The Prussians were the next to test Napoleon, declaring war on him in 1806. The Austrians tried again in 1809. Napoleon didn't start any of these wars, but he won them all. When Russia broke an uneasy peace in 1812, Napoleon decided to invade. But this proved his undoing. His catastrophic winter retreat from Moscow cost him more than half a million casualties. The end came in June 1815 at the Battle of Waterloo, where the combined European armies, led by the Duke of Wellington, decisively defeated Napoleon's forces. The battle could have gone either way. Wellington himself described it as the nearest run thing you ever saw in your life. In all, Napoleon won 46 of the 60 battles he fought, drawing seven and losing seven. His record clearly marks him as one of the greatest military commanders of all time. Yet, while Napoleon is best remembered for his military exploits, it's his political reforms, both inside and outside of France, that had the most lasting effect. In France, he established the Code Napoleon, a distillation of 42 competing and often contradictory legal codes into a single body of French law. He modernized the French educational system and created the Sorbonne, which became one of the great universities of Europe. He promoted a building boom in Paris, a city whose architecture continues to enchant us. The bridges he built across the Seine and the sewer system he constructed beneath the city still function today. To Europe, Napoleon brought the best fruits of the French Revolution, concepts of equality and meritocracy. He liberated the Jews from the ghettos to which they had been confined for centuries, leading to an explosion of artistic, scientific, and economic innovation from this long-oppressed minority. It's hard to assess Napoleon because he was responsible for all these good things while also being responsible for much that was bad. But we can say this with certainty. To compare him to the murderous, oppressive dictators of the 20th century, like Hitler and Stalin, or their tin pot versions like Saddam Hussein or Colonel Gaddafi, is a gross injustice. Napoleon was sui generis, unique unto himself, and proof positive that one man, given the right circumstances, can change history. I'm Andrew Roberts for Prager University. Life isn't fair. And you know what? It can't be. Here's the problem. The word fair doesn't mean justice or equity or indeed anything very specific. Instead, it's become a sort of all-purpose statement of moral superiority. Superiority tinged paradoxically with victimhood. Now, fairness does have an exact meaning in certain contexts. For example, if we're playing a game, fairness means that the rules should be applied impartially. When we're kids and our parents and teachers set the rules, the word still has that essential meaning. It's a young person's way of demanding what we might call equality before the law. But as we get older, the word becomes more of a whine. In the mouth of a teenager, trust me on this, it's not fair means, more often than not, you won't let me do something I want. In recent years, though, something odd has happened. Adults have started using the word in much the same way that teenagers do. More than in any previous generation, people today retain their teenage sense of self-centeredness. They use it's not fair as a catch-all complaint, as an assertion of wounded entitlement. Look at a Google graph of the use of the word fairness. From around 1965, it looks like the proverbial hockey stick. Flat, and then it suddenly shoots up. We've developed a fairness obsession. But what do we mean when we use the word? Do we mean justice? Do we mean equality? Do we mean need? Or do we mean something else? Suppose you and Jane buy a cake together. You pay $6 and Jane pays $4. What would be the fair way? to split it up. 
you could do it on the basis of proportionality. In other words, you get 60% of the cake and Jane gets 40%. Or you could do it on the basis of strict egalitarianism, half each regardless of who paid what. Or you could do it on the basis of wealth. Jane has much less money than you for non-essentials like cake, so maybe she should get the larger share. A case can be made for each approach. But the beauty of the word fair is that it doesn't require you to come down clearly in favour of any of them. It gives you the cover of ambiguity. So, for example, when a politician says, we want the rich to pay their fair share, he doesn't usually mean that he wants the rich to pay taxes at the same rate as everyone else. He means that he wants them to pay extra. The word fair lets him present higher rates of taxation as a form of justice. But only if we don't think about it too hard. That's the beauty of it. Fair doesn't ultimately mean proportionate or impartial or equal. You can use it to mean almost any positive thing you like. I want fairness generally means, look at me, I'm a nice person. Demanding fairness lets you tell the world how decent you are without your actually having to contribute a penny. It's a kind of vanity. Mirror, mirror on the wall, who's the fairest of them all? Let's get real. The only way to distribute the cake is to see how much people are prepared to pay for their slice. Sure, that could leave a banker with a bigger slice than a baker. Sure, we might not like that distribution. We might feel that the baker is doing something more valuable than the banker. He's making delicious pastries while the money man doesn't seem to be making anything except money for himself. But how can we judge someone else's economic worth? You might want bakers to be paid more than bankers. I might want teachers to be paid more than movie stars. Since we all have our own preferences, the only way to measure the economic value of a service is to see how much others are prepared to pay for it. That's what the market does. It aggregates our preferences. It doesn't ask us in the abstract what we think someone else deserves. It tests in reality how many hours of our own labour we're prepared to put in in exchange for a product or a service. Under every other economic system, our relations are mediated by accidents of birth and social caste, and financial rewards are determined by favouritism. The free market alone gives everyone the same rights. My money is as good as yours. You can't get fairer than that. I'm Daniel Hannan, President of the Initiative for Free Trade and author of Inventing Freedom for Prager University. Is America's national anthem racist? Had you asked this question just a few years ago to fans at a baseball, basketball, or football game, they would have assumed you had imbibed one too many beers. Today, thanks to an assault by the progressive left on the Star Spangled Banner and its composer, Francis Scott Key, you might get a different reaction. For example, here's what Jason Johnson, journalism professor at Morgan State University and popular cable news commentator, wrote about the anthem. It is one of the most racist, pro-slavery, anti-black songs in the American lexicon. Is Johnson serious? Actually, he is. And sadly, a lot of progressives agree with him. But why? To answer that question, we need a brief history of the song. Key wrote the Star Spangled Banner after witnessing the American victory at the Battle of Fort McHenry during the War of 1812, a rare bright spot in the young country's second conflict with Britain, a conflict in which the Americans mostly got their butts kicked. Critics like Johnson focus on the third stanza, in which Key mocks the retreating British soldiers. Before describing those lyrics, I need to make a point. The third stanza is virtually unknown. Almost no American has ever sung, read, or heard it. But even so, it's not nearly as offensive as it's made out to be. Here's what Key wrote. No refuge could save the hireling and slave from the terror of flight or the gloom of the grave. The claim of racism focuses, of course, on Key's use of the word slave, which, so the argument goes, refers to the British Second Corps of Colonial Marines. This unit was composed of former American slaves who had been encouraged to escape bondage and fight alongside British troops. 
According to this line of thinking, the slave-owning Key, a prominent attorney, was terribly upset by the idea of freed blacks fighting against their former masters and was so gratified by their defeat that he inserted this line into his poem. Like many Americans living in the early 19th century, Key's record on race was mixed. On the one hand, he owned slaves himself. On the other, he offered free legal representation to slaves petitioning the Maryland court for their freedom. In 1835, he served as prosecutor in a case in Washington, D.C. of an enslaved black man, Arthur Bowen, who was accused of threatening his white female owner. But when a riot ensued over the incident, Key bravely stood between Bowen and a lynch mob bent on killing him. With respect to the anthem, there's no direct evidence that Key was referring to the Second Corps of Colonial Marines, that he even knew the unit existed or cared if it did. It should further be noted that this unit was not even present at the battle, so Key could not have seen them fleeing the field. Why then did Key use the word slave? We'll never know for sure, of course, but it's important to note that Key was not the first person to use the expression hirelings and slaves. It was a common rhetorical device of the time used on both sides of the Atlantic. You find it in newspaper articles and English language literature well before the onset of the war. It was an all-purpose insult that could be used to refer to enemy troops, foreign leaders, corrupt politicians, or anyone else in need of a put-down. For example, in 1795, long before the Second Corps of Colonial Marines even existed, a dispatch from Baltimore condemned the hireling slaves of the English King George III. And remember, slave was a convenient rhyme for grave. Key was, after all, writing a poem. It may be as simple as that. Before the recent ruckus, no one who sang the national anthem thought it sent a racial message. If anything, people believed that the anthem promoted unity as it was intended to do. Besides, as previously noted, hardly any Americans even knew the third stanza existed. During World War II, GIs trying to uncover German infiltrators would ask suspected spies to sing the second or third or fourth verse of the Star Spangled Banner. If they didn't know the words, they were assumed to be genuine Americans. Those who declare the flag and the national anthem to be racist would do well to remember that Martin Luther King Jr. and his supporters carried the American flag during their famous Selma March. When they reached the State House in Montgomery, Alabama, guess what song they sang? That's right, the Star Spangled Banner. I'm James Robbins, columnist for USA Today and author of Erasing America for Prager University. There are only two things I can tell you today that come with absolutely no agenda. The first is congratulations. The second is good luck. Everything else is what I like to call the dirty truth, which is just another way of saying it's my opinion. And in my opinion, you have all been given some terrible advice. And that advice is this, follow your passion. Every time I watch the Oscars, I cringe when some famous movie star, trophy in hand, starts to deconstruct the secret of their success. It's always the same thing. Don't let anyone tell you that you don't have what it takes, kid. And the ever popular, never give up on your dreams. Look, I understand the importance of persistence and the value of encouragement, but who tells a stranger to never give up on their dreams without even knowing what it is they're dreaming? I mean, how can Lady Gaga possibly know where your passion will lead you? Have these people never seen American Idol? Year after year, thousands of aspiring American idols show up with great expectations only to learn that they don't possess the skills they thought they did. What's really amazing, though, is not their lack of talent. The world's full of people who can't sing. It's their genuine shock at being rejected. The incredible realization that their passion and their ability had nothing to do with each other. Look, if we're talking about your hobby, by all means, let your passion lead you. But when it comes to making a living, it's easy to forget the dirty truth. Just because you're passionate about something doesn't mean you won't suck at it. And just because you've earned a degree in your chosen field, it doesn't mean you're going to find your dream job. 
Dream jobs are usually just that, dreams. But their imaginary existence just might keep you from exploring careers that offer a legitimate chance to perform meaningful work and develop a genuine passion for the job you already have. Because here's another dirty truth. Your happiness on the job has very little to do with the work itself. On Dirty Jobs, I remember a very successful septic tank cleaner, a multimillionaire who told me the secret to his success. I looked around to see where everyone else was headed, he said, and then I went the opposite way. Then I got good at my work. Then I began to prosper, and then one day I realized I was passionate about other people's crap. I've heard that same basic story from welders, plumbers, carpenters, electricians, HVAC professionals, hundreds of other skilled tradesmen who followed opportunity, not passion, and prospered as a result. Consider the reality of the current job market. Right now, millions of people with degrees and diplomas are out there competing for a relatively narrow set of opportunities that polite society calls good careers. Now, meanwhile, employers are struggling to fill nearly 5.8 million jobs that nobody's trained to do. This is the skills gap. It's real, and its cause is actually very simple. When people follow their passion, hmm. they miss out on all kinds of opportunities they didn't even know existed. When I was 16, I wanted to follow in my grandfather's footsteps. He was a skilled tradesman, could build a house without a blueprint. That was my passion, and I followed it for years. I took all the shop classes at school. I did all I could to absorb the knowledge and skill that came so easily to my granddad. Unfortunately, the handy gene is recessive. It skipped right over me, and I struggled mightily to overcome my deficiencies, but I couldn't. I was one of those contestants on American Idol who believed his passion was enough to ensure his success. One day, I brought home a sconce I had made in wood shop. It looked like a paramecium. After a heavy sigh, my granddad gave me the best advice I've ever received. He told me, Mike, you can still be a tradesman, but only if you get yourself a different kind of toolbox. At the time, this felt contrary to everything I believed about the importance of passion and persistence and staying the course. But of course he was right, because Staying the course, that only makes sense if you're headed in a sensible direction. And while passion is way too important to be without, it is way too fickle to follow around. Which brings us to the final dirty truth. Never follow your passion, but always bring it with you. Congratulations again, and good luck. I'm Mike Rowe from MicroWorks for Prager University. Thank you for watching this video. To help keep PragerU videos free, please consider making a tax-deductible donation.